Awesome. So we met uh, a couple of months ago in San Francisco. We had a fantastic chat about culture, uh, which is something uh, I want to touch uh, about your ideas uh, a bit later. But why don't we start by uh, you giving us some information? You were uh, you, you started investing and became one of the most well-known investors in San Francisco. So how how did this start for you? Um, you it really started by serendipity. Uh, I was working at Google, and when I was working at Google, I met somebody named Ron Conway. And I was always interested. My dad was an entrepreneur. He invented the first fully automated fortune cookie machine. And he would, had one of the first PhD, Asian American PhDs at UCLA. And he was a real inspiration and a discouraging, you know, what's the, uh, and a deterrent for me. Inspiration because he always told me to build, don't take. The, and in other words, he encouraged me to be an engineer and try to build something. But it was a, dis, a deterrent because I saw how hard it was to build a company. And the toll it can take. And so I always wanted to be the person behind the founder. And I went to law school with a little bit of that in mind, never thinking I wanted to be a lawyer. But I was working at Google during the heyday during 2004, 2005. And I met somebody named Ron Conway, who was one of the first investors in Google. And he became a mentor to me and helped me land a job at our first, my first startup, Stumble Upon. And then after Stumble Upon, I joined his team and eventually joined him to run SV Angel. And so it was very serendipitous. I always knew I wanted to get to a point of where I was helping and supporting builders. But to be honest, when I first started investing, I really had to brush up on what is a liquidation preference? What is pre-money, post-money? Uh, I was I was a noob, and so it wasn't something that I set out to do. But I was very fortunate in the circumstances that created the environment for me to start investing. And when, so, uh, oh, go ahead. What were you doing in Google actually? I was part of a team called New Business Development, and some of the people there were Chris Saka, Ethan Beard, who went on to Facebook and so forth, Megan Smith, who eventually became the CTO of the U.S. of the U.S. government. And so I bring that up just because it was a phenomenal group of people and we're starting this new business group within Google that would explore different projects that weren't core to our business line, um, which was advertising and monetizing the ad and search. And so that was a lot of fun at Google with really some phenomenal people that from whom I learned a lot. and. From there, once there was an opportunity to work with somebody like Ron, and he was partnering with somebody named Steve, Steve Anderson at the time, that's when I jumped. Understanding that venture capital or investing is one of those professions where they don't hire every year. And so if you have the opportunity to, to work with somebody, you should, you should eat when dinner is served. And then you, you join SV Angel and uh, and based on that, uh, how early was it? Is like uh, what, what role did you have? I joined beginning? around 2008, and we started running it. Ron and I in 2008, 2009 period, and we did that for about six six or seven years. What are the what are the first mistakes you've done when it comes to oh. investing? So many. Um, I, I mean, I'm trying to. I'm trying to think of. There's so many that are. So I'm, I have this this torrent of inputs right now. I think a lot of it is one of the biggest mistakes for me is when you don't invest in somebody. I, or let me frame it this way. I, I, when I evaluate a founder or evaluate a company, you think about the what ifs and you think about the person. And so some of the mistakes that I've made that I regret are those where I really love the founder. I really like their vision, but I'm not crazy about their idea. 
And I would much rather passing on somebody like that and seeing it become successful is much harder for me than not investing in something where I wasn't crazy about the founder, but I really liked the idea and it became successful, if that makes any sense. And so a lot of the mistakes that you can make, especially at the earliest stage, is that you can overthink it. You can look for data when the data doesn't really exist, when it's really about evaluating the founder. And if when you're speaking to the founder or working with them, and understanding what he or she is trying to accomplish with their startup. And you're trying to look for potential, potential energy that they'll eventually turn into kinetic energy. And if the signals are there that this is somebody who feels high potential, who's a very clear thinker, who thinks about things differently, and you don't invest in that person and the trend is big enough, those are the mistakes that I regret, as opposed to somebody that um, where you don't have that feeling. Now, it's a very different mistake. The mistakes are very different depending on when you invest. And investing is always going to be a combination of your beginner's mind and your prepared mind. As you get more data, you need to look more, for example, at a Series B, Series C. You now have data on the company and the founder. And so it wouldn't be smart just to use a beginner's mind when evaluating the startup. You also want to look at the data, how they've done, the market opportunity, their plans going forward, because the business is at a very different stage. But at the earliest stage, where SV Angel focused, it's really about the founder and the idea. And so the mistakes that I regret are those when I had a great feeling about the founder, but I still didn't invest. So was it, uh, was it mainly, when you think about it, uh, David, back in the days, it was more about the idea and then you changed your mind with the learnings and the mistakes and it became more about the founders. It, this was a unique time to invest as well, because in the US, this was the greatest acceleration of tech adoption in history. And it was people getting a, a smartphone for the very first time. And when you have that sort of tailwind, that sort of momentum, if somebody is really good and they are investing with that type of tailwind at that early stage, the bet is if their first idea doesn't work, the, the momentum is so strong, the space is so big that they will evolve the idea into something that will work if you're betting on the person. The, the canonical example or the best example of this is, or the most famous example is Kevin Systrom of Instagram. What he started was very different from what Instagram became. And he had meant more degrees of freedom because he had this wind at his back of people getting a phone for the very first time. I mean, around 2004, 2005, Broadband penetration in the U.S. was, I think, 60%. And that was people accessing the internet two hours a day on their PC. And by 2015, my mom had an iPhone 6. You know, she's 80 years old. And you had literally a new user behavior of people like this. And so people are online 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that created a market opportunity uh, where betting on the founder with this space was a good investment thesis. And obviously we're now in a different time where everybody has a mobile phone and everybody's connected to the internet more or less in the U S. And so having that investment thesis today is, I'll just say not smart. I, I wouldn't do it. It's, you don't have the same tailwind. It's uh, it's always, um, we, we noticed that there is a, a very strong correlations between uh, some fantastic investors who did really well for the past uh, 10 or 20 years and their thesis of investing in the founders. And if you remember what, uh, what uh, we, for example, what, what PG or Paul Graham mentioned uh, 
a few years back, he said, good founders by definition would know when a bad idea is bad and would turn it into a good idea. So I don't invest in ideas. And uh, Exactly. Exactly. Ambitious people, you know, to, uh, I always use the analogy, you know, engineering, technology, it is a talent profession. And so it's worthwhile to look at professions, um, to other talent professions. The talent profession that I'm a rabid fan of is sports. And the analogies are very similar in that, especially at a young age, if you look at an athlete, the really successful professional athletes, they're doing what they love ever since they've been eight or nine years old, right? Similarly, technologists who are working in tech companies, building stuff, they're doing what they loved at eight or nine years old. And then there's even more similarities in that um, in sports and, techno and tech, the feedback loop is so tight, right? In sports, it's, you know, when you're eight or nine years old, you run a race with your friend, who's faster, who's stronger, who's better at this sport, who's better at that sport. And hopefully that injects this healthy degree of competitiveness in the person of wanting to, to strive. And similarly in tech, you see that as well. You, you, you have a very tight feedback loop. And so generally speaking, what, what am I driving at? Really great engineers want to work on really significant problems in the same way that really great athletes, as they get older, it's not about the money, it's about the competition. It's about playing, a, you know, a great golfer wants to play at the Masters, not in Saudi Arabia, even though Saudi Arabia may have a bigger purse. And I bring up Saudi Arabia because it's a new tour. I'm not, I'm not just bringing it up randomly, but the Masters is where the best people play. And similarly to PG's po earlier point, really great founders, if the first idea is bad or it's not working, they generally have the ambition, the competitiveness, the drive, the talent to look for um, problems that matter. And that's, you know, the job of an early stage investor is try to identify people uh, who, who may fit into that. And that's, it's the hardest thing to do in any talent profession is you're projecting somebody's talent at a very early age. Somebody like even both of you, Kira Kos and Rauf, you're, you're very different people than you were five years ago. And in five years, you know, the, the person you are today will be unrecognizable. Um, you know, young Jack Dorsey versus Jack Dorsey today, two completely different people. And that's part of what makes it fun is that it's really hard to do. It's really hard to project that. And that's part of what makes it fun and interesting. And you learn about people, you learn about their drive and their talent. And that's, for me, that's what makes the profession fun. It's um it's something we've seen as well. I think the destination and the and the, the country really matters to this as well. We started uh, when we started Terra, me and Rauf, we started going to investors from uh, Cyprus to Greece to uh, the UK and London. Um, everybody was really rejecting, and then we came to San Francisco and we saw a very very different way of looking at things because the question that most investors were asking was was really what if this succeeds? What what if what if this um, idea succeeds? What what is it going to unlock? Whereas the question yeah. earlier was, let in Europe in general it was, let's just poke a lot of holes in this idea and see why yeah. it doesn't work. So the mentality of people in different uh, countries is uh, is very significant to this as well. So it's like the destinations like San Francisco um, are on parallel to this. What are what are your your own views when it comes to we, we just hear so much about Miami today and New York and um and people living from San Francisco. How are you thinking about this? I think I think it's underrated and overrated at the same time. It's underrated in that Regardless of the circumstances, it could be the pandemic, it could be certain trends around uh, people wanting to live in different places. Um, but I think it's underrated in that the world and innovation and technology 
and communities are becoming more distributed. And if you think about even the, one could argue the founding fathers of today's Silicon Valley came out of Fairchild Semiconductor Bell Labs and they were, you know, you had Arthur Rock, Kleiner, you had the people who funded them, people who built companies, it was very localized. And it's literally called Silicon Valley because that's the first types of startups that emerged from that community. And you had this idea that you had to be close to this, uh, the center of gravity if you wanted to do something in technology. And as a result, you you know everybody came to Silicon Valley and and now I think Silicon Valley or anything is is more of a state of mind and so you can and then the tools out there remote working COVID obviously accelerated a lot of these trends where I think startups are more distributed people who have interviewed their co-founders and have never met them in person it's not uncommon I'm not saying it's common but it's not uncommon so I think this is a very underrated point in that. The long-term trend is you're going to see more and more um, startups uh, emerge and communities emerge in different ways. Whereas today, you could argue the founding father, if, if you think that crypto is um, the next wave, and I'm just using crypto as an example, um, the founding father, mother, person, people is Satoshi Nakamoto. It's a white paper, right? It's not... There, and so there are no communities. There is no one community you need to be a part of in order to be in the in crowd, the room where it happens. Sorry, I just, my, my daughter was listening to the Hamilton soundtrack. And so, and, and that's very significant because initial, in any sort of system or community, initial conditions really matter. And that I find really inspiring because you can create a great community anywhere really um, and there isn't this gravitational pull of Silicon Valley. So that's the underrated piece and just a long-term trend. The overrated piece is that community still matter. You're from Greece. You're, you, again, back to the sports analogy, you have um, the greatest basketball player in the world from Greece, Giannis, right? The second yeah. greatest is from, I think he's from Croatia, Doncic, right? And so you could argue to, to say that in the 90s would have been just you'd be laughed at that the greatest player in the world comes from Greece. Right. So the talent in basketball is becoming more distributed. And you see it even in the Olympics before the U.S. would just walk away and they wouldn't even have to lace up their shoes. And now they actually have to play. Right. But from a probability standpoint, if you wanted to play basketball and play against the best competition and have a career in basketball, you got to be in the U.S., hmm. right? So I think it's overrated in the sense that the Bay Area still matters a lot, and that's not going to change for a while. Does it have the same uh, primacy, for lack of a word, where you have to be there? No. But to say that its power relative to other communities is somehow dramatically diminished. I, I don't think is accurate. I think you could, and then that's a metaphor for the US. You know, over time, the, you know, the world is becoming more multipolar. The US is not exactly, if you ask, you know, somebody, even my parents, my parents of 1960, where do you want to go for a better life? I think they would generally say the US but it's not as clear cut as it was in 1960. So I think it's underrated in the sense that it's a trend that um, will be with me for my lifetime, for the rest of my lifetime. Um, and it'll be very different in 30 or 40 years, but I also think 30 or 40 years is a long time away. And for now, it's still an important place to be. Same with the US. So, mm -hmm. um, so those are my general thoughts around that topic. Yeah. Yeah. And then David, you leave from SV Angel uh, and you end up in Samsung, uh, in Samsung Next Front. How did uh, this transi transition happen? And w what did you do once you went there? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, and it's very relevant to this topic. I, after SV Angel, I worked at another fund, Refactor Capital, where I actually focused on health and, and biology. It's now run by my partners, all Bill and Mario is doing a fantastic job. Uh, 
And I was doing a lot of executive coaching and angel investing. And this opportunity at Samsung came up. And the reason why it's relevant to the prior points is I do believe the world is becoming more multipolar. It's not a unique insight, but if you just look at the numbers, you look at where innovation is, you look at the demographics. And so for me to understand a different part of the world, particularly I'm Korean American, I don't speak a lick of Korean, but to understand a different part of the world, a different way of doing business. Um, and I also believe that Samsung has a, a unique opportunity in this next wave of technology, largest mobile footprint in the world. We sell a TV every second, we can build right down to the chip. And so to be able to work with a team that focuses on investments, M&A, uh, helping, helping the startup ecosystem and innovation to flourish for me was a great challenge uh, and something that we're having a lot of fun with. So what's your, uh, David, what's your investment philosophy now that you're in with Samsung Next Ventures? And it's worth mentioning that uh, Samsung is, uh, Samsung Next is, is an investor in Tehran. We are very fortunate to have you guys on board. We, we get, uh, we get a, a lot of support uh, from you guys, not only from from uh, speaking to your team, whether it's uh, Fedi on the sell side, Caroline, or any of uh, any question that that we might have, we we you have the you have this fantastic team that is there available to answer any question, and if they don't, they would connect you with someone who can answer the question. So it's uh, it's great to have you guys on board, and we are very fortunate uh, to uh, to have you as investors. When so when when thinking about Samsung Next Ventures now, in terms of your investment philosophy, did, did it change from your from what you have been doing in the past? And if it's the case, how did it change, and how are you thinking about it now? It it um, stayed the same except for one tweak. Um, and so when I got here, I've been here for about a year. By the way. Thank you for letting us to be in uh, to invest in your company. We've learned a lot from you. It's been great working with you. I'm so thankful to have people like Fadi, Caroline, uh, Brandon, and Angie working with you. Um, so we've learned a lot. And it, it, it um, for us, it's the same in that I have a belief that, and this goes to your point of European versus U.S. investors. I have a belief that. It's not even a belief, it's a fact that I think is underappreciated is that in technology, the pie is always growing. The market is always getting bigger. And so if you create more value than you capture, it's generally a good business model for a pie that's increasing, right? And so for us, ever for my investing career has been about Let's invest in companies, help them and support them along the way, just like how Fadi, Caroline are helping you and our team is helping you. And how we benefit, it will happen. You just have to have faith that it will happen. It will happen if you're an investor while I was at SP Angel or Refactor, the benefit is financial returns. So the financial returns are always gonna be a lagging indicator in that model because you always have to give more than you get. Right. And that was the philosophy that we wanted to have here at Samsung Next is that for companies that we invest in, we're going to create a lot of value, hope to create a lot of value and support you. And the benefits will come. It's less clear how they'll come, but they will come. And the, the difference between my role today and my role when I was at SV Angel or Refactor, purely financial driven uh, funds, is that our returns is our what how we benefit is by growing the community maybe having founders have a different perception of samsung of understanding where the world is going in areas we care about so for example as it relates to Terra, fitness and health is an area that we care about i'm wearing a samsung watch we have all of the features that a lot of the companies have and for us to think about okay Where's the world going? How are people using technology? What are some of the trends? And I deeply believe that the best way to think about these questions are to work with the people and support the people who are building the future. And so in my prior careers, the value capture for lack of a better term, what, uh, term is, hey, are you generating good financial returns? For us, the value capture here is, are we learning? 
Are we getting better? Are we thinking differently as a company? And so are, are we having conversations that nobody else can have? Because you, any startup build for hundreds, you know, and the whole, whole sort of make something people want, Kevin Kelly, um, thousand true fans, you are literally doing things that don't scale and trying to get to a place where you do that at scale. We build for millions and billions. So our perspective will be naturally very different. And so for us to be the only people in the world that have these conversations with both parties, it's really interesting, fascinating, and hopefully you benefit from the conversations we have from people at Samsung and Samsung benefits from the conversations we have with you. You're, I mean, this is, this is a great example. I would say, you know, the number one thing we talked about timing earlier, the number one thing for an investor is timing. That's the most important thing in my view. It's like there are more, there are, there's more bad timing than there are bad ideas. Right. So if you look at, you know, a lot of investors, what you would do is you would look at web, web 1.0 and you say, okay, what didn't work? Webvan didn't work. Pets.com didn't work. Um, even Google, even search didn't work in terms of Lycos and uh, some of the, some of the early altos or not altos. It's some of the early search engines, but it turns out in some markets being the last mover, there is a real advantage to being the last mover because the timing is better, right? YouTube, there are a lot of companies that tried to do YouTube, but it didn't have the flash penetration. Flash at that point, it was 90% desktop penetration and broadband was starting to become a thing, right? With you, with Terra, five or six years ago, probably doesn't work, I would argue. And this is part of our thesis of investing in you, where it's like, yeah, people are just getting Fitbits. The conversation around steps, 10,000 steps is just starting. And people aren't really thinking, they're still thinking about health in terms of going to the Equinox or the gym and working out. Now there's a different conversation and there's a different mindset around health. I want to track what I do. Hey, I didn't work out, but I walked 8,000 steps, right? Or, you know, even things like Peloton or Avron or some of the companies that are introducing gaming dynamics into fitness. And so fitness and health, there's a very different mindset globally around it. And then obviously the pandemic introduced um, at-home fitness behaviors. And so a company like Terra, the timing is much better than it was even three to five years ago. And so um, I think the coffee started to kick in because I went down a couple of rabbit holes, but for us at Samsung Next, it is literally, it's simple, but not easy. You support the best builders and founders in areas you care about. When I was at SV and Refactor, the areas we cared about were really predicated on what are the, what are the interesting places to invest as an investor. At Samsung Next, they're really built on, hey, what are areas that are interesting for us? So David, we have um, a huge number of, uh... Uh, of startups using at the moment using oh I would say I would not say huge numbers but few hundreds using using uh, Terra API to access fitness wearables data and uh, a lot of them are currently fundraising I'm sure a lot of them would be listening to this podcast as we have a newsletter and we inform the startups of what we are building and doing with our investors so since you touched on on your investment philosophy if if you can tell if you can tell the founders what that the ones that are on early stage to approach Samsung Nest, what should they have? What should they focus on? And when is the right time to speak to you? And also just, just to, add the, to add another question there, it's um, from your side as well, how do you make sure that the timing is right and you are identifying these founders at the right timing? Oh, that's such a hard question. I mean, um, a lot of it is speaking to the founders, um, understanding their origin story, understanding, um, getting back to the earlier point about PG's point around people who find valuable ideas. One could argue, and I believe that really technical people, engineers, uh, people who are really deep in product and technology, they understand the change and pace of technology. And 
they understand what's possible. And in a way that a non-engineer or product person just can't, right? And it's sort of the old saying that what a non-engineer thinks is hard is actually easy. And what a non-engineer thinks is easy is actually hard. Spell check in Google search, for example. And so um, for me, it's just meeting really talented people who are working on this problem and who can articulate why the timing is right. Because, you know, there's a great saying, I forgot who said it, of like human needs change much more slowly than the pace of technology. And the really great startups understand when certain intersection points hit. Our human needs today are basically the same as they were through, you know, throughout history. It's just Maslow's hierarchy of needs and so forth and so on. But the pace of te technology changes very rapidly. So to your question, Kirikos, I think it's talking to really smart people. They may not just be founders. They, you know, today, for example, a hot topic is VR, AR, right? And so the question is, um, how close are we to having something that doesn't, um, I still get some low level nausea from it, even the Oculus 2, maybe it's a psychosomatic thing, um, but it's still not something we had, we got one for the holidays, but it's still not something, I mean, our family doesn't use it anymore. And so why is that? Is it because the applications are bad or because the technology is not there? And sometimes the answer is a lot more subtle than what a lay person would think. Maybe the technology isn't there. You know, in the case of the iPhone and the smartphone, the glass wasn't there because Jobs famously didn't want the buttons, right? And so a lot of it is talking to the founders and a recognition that 95% of the time you're gonna be wrong. And getting back to your point around European investors, a lot of investors, the mistake that I try not to make, but it's human nature, they think in probability, they don't think in expected value, right? Probability is like, will this work? That's not the right question. The right question is, if the one of N outcome works, i.e. a probability of 1%, how big does it get, right? And so, Engineers, investors tend to think in terms of expected value, not probability. So, um, so for me and for our team, what we try to encourage is talk to as many people as you can. It could be founders, it could be other investors, it could be people who are doing research. Now, the really different thing today than it was when I was investing for the first time is the amount of content that's available. Um, online, uh, even if you, you know, even in Twitter, if you dig and look in the right places, you're going to find some of the smartest conversations around topics that you're, you're trying to learn. Um, so, uh, so those are some of the things that we look for, some of the tools that I use. Oh, so let what, me go uh, back to Raul's point. Oh, sorry, yes. go ahead. Yes. Let's, let's, oh, let's you had asked me what should, what startups we should look for. We want to work with any startup that um, is, is at really any stage. I and mean, we've invested in companies like, um, FTX, Axie Infinity at much higher valuations. And one of the, for me, one of the, it is very easy to confuse or conflate growth with valuation. And so people look at something like, let's take Airbnb at a billion dollars valuation back in the day and say, I'm not going to invest in that. It's, it's too expensive, but they don't look at the level, the number of engineers, the growth rate, the, the market opportunity in front of them. And I say number of engineers because a lot of the great tech companies, and that's a larger discussion, their, their output per employee is much higher than other startups. Right. And so if you look at a company, and they're still less than a thousand or 500 and you look at their growth rate, which is only accelerating over time in many ways, if you want to adjust for risk relative to returns and learning, you would rather be a part of that company than a company just started. So we will work with any company that where we believe, um, in the team, either the team's potential or what the team has done in an area that's relevant for us. But given our check size as well, because we are at the tail end of our fund and because we believe in investing in more companies, I would say we tend towards uh, 
the seed stage, but we really invest in any stage. One, one last question before we move to the next uh, topic is, is, are you industry agnostic or are you focusing on specific industries? I would say we're industry agnostic, but um, trend specific. And it's always hard to spot trends, but you just look almost, uh, it's almost, I'm not a student of art, but so I may be butchering this analogy, but it's almost like an impressionistic painting where you just look at it and you say, the lines aren't clearly defined, but I kind of get what <laughs> what the painting is trying to say, what the painting is. And similarly with us, if we say health and fitness, that to us is a general trend of, and I think your company uh, nails this better than most of, hey, people are more, uh, um, they're more mindful of their health. They think of health more holistically. And when you become more mindful of anything, it's something that you either want to track or you want more inputs on, even how you sleep, how, what you eat and so forth. And so what does that mean? And similar, and that trend can cut across a lot of industries, hardware, um, and hardware is not necessarily an industry, but certainly obviously fitness equipment or apps or software with what you're doing, um, or uh, content. And so for us, we think more in terms of trends as opposed to specific industries. And then getting uh, back to the wearable question, uh, David, what do you, what wearables do you use? I am wearing a Samsung watch. Um, I also wear an Aura ring. Um, Aura is probably my favorite product, if I had to pick one. Uh, I don't know if I sh you should delete that piece, given that I work for <laughs> Samsung, but I'll let the market speak for itself. But it's also a preference thing. I like wearing um, old school, just regular watches. I'm not a huge fan of the fit of any watch that's a fitness watch. Um, and I like the Aura because it's sort of a proxy for my wedding ring and it's directionally correct. Um, may not be, I don't know if it's precise, but for me, it's like, okay, was I relatively active today? How are you using the data? So you're using an Aura uh, device and a Samsung from the Aura device you'd probably get your core temperature, you're going to get your sleep levels. If you get the latest one, probably you get access to your activity heart rates, uh, heart rate variability as well. And then with the Samsung watch, uh, you get uh, ECG as well. Uh, you get yes. blood pressure uh, as well. So how, how are, you, are you, are you, are you actually using the data in a certain way or? Uh, and if so, how do you, how do you do it? Good question. So I'm a cancer survivor and so, and I had pretty intense treatment. And so um, I have a heart condition. I have certain things that I look out for. And so one thing I do like about the watch is that I can track like ECG or heart rate. I may track it a little differently than most people. Um, but, and this is not a Samsung watch, an Apple watch, a Fitbit thing or anything. But if you took it away from me, um, I don't think I would necessarily, I, I still have other, you know, there are other ways of tracking those metrics. Um, for me, my primary use case is, uh, did I walk my steps that I need to walk because I don't have a great back? Um, and also uh, the sleep, I think on Aura is very helpful. And what was interesting with the sleep is, um, one of the things that I learned, this is random, is how much alcohol can affect your sleep. And so, you know, having up to two drinks you're going to be okay. But that two drink like limit, once you have three drinks, it really affects your quality of your sleep. Um, and that's something that, uh, has been interesting and has affected my behavior. And uh, which of the data are you measuring? You mentioned cancer. Is there something specific you look at? No, you know, I tend to measure, um, I've gone through fits and starts. So I used to measure a lot of it was the heart rate, ECG, and that's when the technology wasn't great. Um, and now I generally try to measure inputs. I use this app called way of life. You could use anything where it's like, did I walk my 10,000 steps? Did I, uh, meditate? Did I do X? Did I stretch? 
And so um, I'm a big believer of one of the things that I, and this is random, but I, I try to um, do, do a little something every day. And I feel like that's a better way of, of creating accountability and thinking about health rather than the outputs. And I figure if I eat right, if I walk enough, if I drink a lot of water, if I don't drink as much alcohol, all the things that you're supposed to do, um, then I'll generally be okay. I believe in, I, I think it's very easy, especially when I got sick. When I got sick, I had like 8% body fat. I didn't eat red meat. I was this fitness junkie um, and I got really, really sick. So. I think one of the lessons that taught me is, you know, in this sort of debate of fragility versus resilience, I generally tend towards resilience because you really can't control your outcomes um, mm. as much as we'd like to think. In the wearables uh, example you mentioned earlier, um, it's it's one of the foundation foundational things that are changing. Uh, and, and you can say that with Terra, we are changing this as well. It's all of those years you've been looking at the data in a very uh, static way. You will be doing yeah. a, a blood analysis in your doctor, for example, and the doctor is looking at your biomarker at that timestamp, right? In a very specific point in time. Whereas now, if you wear your aura ring, uh, you can look at the biomarkers in a real time way. And you can have a graph of someone's past for the last five years. Right, so literally, this changes uh, the way that we understand health, and it's one of the the ways that is just so many companies that can build on top of Terra by using these uh, these data, and technically, engineers can change health instead of doctors changing health, which yes. is one of the things we usually say at Terra. But just to give you an example of this, I had COVID about a year ago. And I'm wearing a Garmin device. My Garmin device uh, was measuring uh, oxygen saturation. It was measuring my sleep. It was measuring my heart rate uh, and my heart rate variability. And I just see one day that my oxygen saturation levels are 5% down. My heart rate is, uh, it was 6% up. And I have like, my heart, I have my heart rate for the last uh, probably 10 years because I was using Polar devices, Samsung devices, Garmin devices over the years. And it, it never occurred in the past. So I had so many of the, the biomarkers and the things that the wearables are measuring, and I could see that trend shifting. I was wondering why, and then I go and, uh, and do a COVID test, and I realized that, oh, wow. oh you know what, I have COVID. And then after the, the, the rest six months, after I uh, recovered from COVID, I see my heart rate not going back to the, the normal levels. And after month seven or eight, it actually went to the, back to the, the normal levels, which comes to tell you is just think if someone was smart enough to just build an app that just recognizes the patterns based on wearable information, how much better would we be thinking about uh, COVID and about diseases in general? But it, it's it's back in the point of measuring all that time, all, all that data in a, in a real time way and uh, in, instead of a static way of looking at it. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's the opportunity, um, the huge opportunity for your company, for Terra. Um, our experience was the tough part with a lot of this wearable data is, is tying it to outcomes. And so generally when you tie it to outcomes, you generally have to close the loop with your physician or your health coach or whoever that has that data as well. And it's not clear we're there yet in terms of, okay, I'm tracking all this data. So what? Okay. I should not drink more than two glasses of wine. If I want to sleep well, I should, uh, my heart rate goes up when I like, so what? And so, but, but I do think we're on the precipice of tying that to outcomes. Your example of COVID is a great example, right? And it's not just, you know, the Apple ad of, oh, so-and-so, their heart rate went up and they, they, may, they may have crashed on their bike, but it is, hey, what are some ways that if, with all the data that you have, and then all the data that engineers have, and all the data that maybe your physician has, 
what are, how does that change outcomes? And I think that is a really, um, that'll be a place where I think then you'll see um, a lot of behaviors change. Um, hopefully systems will change, particularly here in the US. But it all starts with what you're doing here, which is aggregating the data and making it structured and usable by others. A lot of people can get the data. Not many people can make the data usable for others. And that's something that you're doing. It's something that appealed to us. Yeah, exactly. And we have seen uh, a huge number of a uh, big proportion of our clients are currently working on uh, machine learning models to specifically yes. in preventative uh, space. So not only analyzing and showing data, but also how can we how can we predict what could happen to this individual when we get not only the historical data but then the daily activities um but it's but it's not only on the like when crunching numbers is not the only piece but the other piece is that the gamification effect if you think of how few clients use us in a way where you're walking you're doing your steps on a daily basis but then how can we make this more interesting to you not only walking not only yes. getting to the goal but one of our clients, for example, build trees for every mile that you walk, which means that you're not only walking, but also is they are incentivizing you to contribute to the environment. And uh, mm. you find other clients who are doing fitness challenges. So if you like, you enjoy walking, then they would incentivize you to walk a little bit more and they will give you a gift. So it goes from the very small scale of how can we incentivize people to be healthier, but also how can we go to the next step, which is, using machine learning models to predict what an individual could get in terms of disease or even like a uh, fever or COVID or any sort of uh, uh, disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. David, I wanted to, I don't think we have much time for this, but uh, we had a fantastic conversation a couple of months ago in San Francisco about culture. And I wanted to hear your thoughts about, uh, we, we made a very interesting correlation between teams, uh, athletic teams like football teams, uh, basketball teams, and how were they thinking about culture and how this translates to business culture and how founders need to be thinking about this. Can you walk us uh, through a similar conversation? So. Everybody can really hear. It's like I always have the example of Barcelona in football of they started thinking about uh, let's think culture first and let's think how do we build a, a culture based on a team is extremely humble, a, a player is extremely humble, we don't get arrogant people in. And um, they, they, they set the specific culture, specific rules down, and they, they created one of the best football, football teams of all times. Um, so how do you see this? How, how, should we, um, how should we be looking at business through the lens of uh, sports, uh, sports culture? Um, the tough part about what you do is I do believe, you know, I, and I think cultures they exist in households, they exist in teams, they exist in companies, they exist in any group of people that are trying that have common goals, and that work together, live together. And it really all starts at the top. And so you as the leader, uh, both of you as the founders, you're really setting the tone, you're you are the culture setters, what you do, what you say every single day, you may not think that people are watching you, but they're watching you. And so in the same way that you as an individual, you make trade-offs as to what you value in your life. You're, you're going to value different things that I value and so forth and so on. We're all unique in what we want in our life. And the company is going to make those trade-offs as well. And so, the most important thing you, you mentioned Barcelona is a great example is I, and, and this isn't something that I'm a great practitioner at. It's something that I've studied and you see it is defining what you're not is really important. And you have to be able to look at a, an all star candidate who for a particular job and just say they are not a culture fit. 
And that doesn't mean they're bad at what they do. It may mean they're excellent at what they do, but you have to specify what is my getting back to health. My executive coach um, talked about this. What is your immune system? Setting your immune system is very important because you're basically you're explicitly saying what we aren't. And that you have to think about before in many ways of what you are. Everybody can say what they want to be. And generally, if you look at really long value statements and culture statements, it's, it's pretty meaningless. It's like this laundry list of things that people want to be. And it's like, of course, people want to be all these things, but nobody is all these things. And you have to make trade-offs and you have to explicitly say, what are we looking for? And I think the example we, we use with Barcelona was um, they may not have, and tell me if I'm off, they may not have the best players, they may not have um, the highest payroll, but they look for a specific type of player. Does that player love football? Does that player think about team first? Does that people player, is that player somebody who on a Friday night, they're on the pitch or they're, they're, playing, they're playing football while others are out partying? And that's not to say that what I just said, that frame sounds like the people who aren't part of that, um, that that's a bad thing and that's judgmental. It's not because the trade-off you're making are is the people may not be as talented, right? And so the culture I think is, um, and even in my family, you know, my my wife and I, you know, one of the examples is the great the somebody once told me, and this is what I hang my hat on, is that kids will never do what you tell them to do, but they will always copy what you do. And so I, I remember hearing my, my kids using some words and they're not swear words, but there are words that I, or terms of phrase or that I would only use with my wife. And you realize they listen to everything. They copy everything. And that is, that is in many ways culture. And whether you, and that's the hardest thing as a leader, when you're having a down day, you lost that customer, fundraising is not going well, and your job is to come in and, and exude calm, and this is, you know, things are going well. Not well, but, you know, we're on the right path. And, and mentally and emotionally, that's tough. You know, even as a young parent, you have a tough day at work, and you know, I do it all the time, tough day at work or whatever. You come home and you don't want to be with your kids. You know, you just want to veg out, have a drink, relax, unwind. And um, yeah, so I'm kind of rambling because it's such a large topic. But I think what we refer to is setting the, setting the immune system of your company. And sometimes that is about um, really the first step is saying what we aren't and then looking inward and saying, okay, what are the, who are the type of people that we're looking for? Who are the type of people that are going to love this? And I'm not going to apologize for it. I'm an intense person. I was in the special forces. This is how I define success and it gets me going. And it may not be the right way for a lot of people. People can, have the same amount of output with a different type of mindset, but they're not going to fit in here and I'm not going to apologize for it. And so those are the teams that really are resilient and grow. And it takes a certain amount of self-awareness from the founder to be able to say, this is what we're not going to be. Um, because that is the first step in defining uh, what you do want to be. Yeah. One of the, the, the did the, I capture the, that? Sorry, it's a it's a huge topic, but yeah, um, but we, I do we, think that it's yeah. We would probably need um, uh, five hours Another, discussion to, exactly to, to do this. Yeah. But uh, in your example of special forces, this is one of the decisions um, we made when it comes to um, remote work versus in person work. Uh, one of the things uh, we are thinking, I've, as, as I mentioned at the time, I've been into the Special Forces for a while. And one of the questions I'm asking myself all the time is, would you be able to build a Special Forces team if you are remotely? And the answer to this is no. And the reason is, 
in the special forces you really became a team once everybody yeah. was struggling together on a mountain for a very long period of time and it's through the struggle that actually you realize that this unit became a team so it's it's one of the ways uh we discussed and we decided as well to to be doing everything in person because a client might be calling at uh, 11 or 12 in the night and we just grab our stuff uh, we meet and we fix the the issue uh, because that's that's the way um that you create uh, that you create teams but obviously we just have so much uh, to learn in this space yeah that's an incredible example because you know, you hear and read all of these discussions around remote work, about that's why, you know, one of the things as an executive coach, I would tell founders is don't read, don't read stuff that is how to, or try to avoid it or take it with, read it as a story. Don't read it as a lesson. Um, because what you just articulated is a very different mindset from another founder by, you know, by definition. And that's what gets you going. As, and that's what you're, where you're most effective. And that's a certain culture that will attract certain people and will also repel certain people. And that's okay. Um, and, and naturally there are some, you can just, you get my point of, it's gonna be malleable, it's gonna be dynamic, it's gonna evolve, but eventually, but in the earliest days, making that trade off of what, of, um, being very clear of that is is uh i think that's the first step in building a culture and uh when you see yeah. what kiriakos mentioned so sitting together it's super difficult to appreciate what's going on when you are uh, remotely maybe some companies are succeeding doing this in a fantastic way uh, but it's difficult for us to see how can we appreciate that this is a sort of a problem that we need to sit together and solve together and uh, one team member might be solving something super complicated and we need to help that team member. So we have that spirit in the team, which we find uh, super valuable. But uh, at, at the same time, building, uh, getting, we interviewed a lot of uh, great candidates from a technical perspective, but that's the actually, that's the last key points that we, that key point that we focus on. Before that, we have two things which are Super important. So the way we think about it is number one, we look at the principles and values. And when we speak about values is more of, are these people who will fight with us? Are these people are transparent enough? Are they going to tell us when something is wrong? Are they as truthful as we are to them? And we, to the extent where when we do an interview, we, are, we, we believe that we're so truthful that we give you feedback on the spot. We don't need to go back and then send you an email and be bureaucratic and politics. and we give you feedback on the spot on what you think you do it, you did right, what you th we think you did wrong, and we tell you our decision is subjective. Tell me if you're wrong, if I am wrong in my in my decision, and maybe I didn't see something that you uh, or maybe you didn't portray it well because interviews are, are are very subjective. You don't know if someone is good from an interview, and and we had that we had we were in a position where sometimes we got some great candidates from a technical perspective who were had an offer from Google, Facebook, and, and Terra at the same time. And it's a 50-50. Sometimes they choose Facebook, sometimes they choose Terra. And we are very proud of this. And it's more of uh, why the reason why they are choosing Facebook makes us clearly think that they would not fit for us. Yeah. I mean, you hit on something really interesting in terms of um, every company, every group of people has their own communication protocol. What do I mean by that? It's how we communicate, right? And what you just described is very direct, candid feedback that, and some, or let me rephrase, direct feedback, if delivered in a certain way, can come off as brusque. Direct feedback, if given in a certain way, can also come off as caring. And again, there are trade-offs, I'm sort of deviating. Let me get back to my original point. Every team has a unique way of communicating. And that is a function of the culture that you're setting, like the types of people that are, you're bringing into the organization. That's why whenever I see, especially back maybe five or six years ago, you would see companies acquire teams and break them up 
And I never understood that because I said, I would think to myself, like the whole reason why you're acquiring this team is they communicate with each other and they work together in a way that is, that is what makes the one plus one equals three or what have you, right? Is that when I say something to you, you know exactly what I, what I mean. And I'm not saying something that you're not hearing or you're not hearing something that I'm not saying. That's when culture starts breaking down and the communication is off. And every company has different protocols. So for example, at Samsung Next, we have, we have three offices in many ways. We have US, Korea, and Israel. And the communication protocol among the three different cultures is very different, right? And you have to respect that. You have to understand that. You have to be aware of that, right? But at a startup, when you're trying to do something really hard, you develop your own protocol. And that is a function of the culture that you're setting. So even terms like we fight, we're transparent, we're on the spot feedback. Some people that may not resonate with some people that are really, really good. And they, they, their style of working is very different and that's okay. Right. And similarly, the people that do resonate with that may or may not be as talented, but depending on the role that may be okay too. Um, but I think that is the hard part about setting culture or, or setting a tone as a leader because you're the one who has to decide that. Yeah. David, it seems like uh, we, we just took too much of your time. It no, seems not at like, all. It seems like we need to to uh, take another slot of three hours and speak about culture. I think it would be extremely, extremely interesting to do that. Yeah, it's so, I mean, I don't, I don't, and I'm not just saying, I don't envy the, pe you know, founders like you or people who do it. By that, I mean, it's, it's probably the hardest part of your job because um, when things are going really well, it's very easy to ignore it. And if you ignore it, it doesn't scale. And when things are going poorly, it's very hard to maintain it, right? And it, and it is just having like deep self-awareness of like what's what culture, you know, one of the things that I would say is like, hey, you want to create the company where your children would want to work, right? And that doesn't mean you're making it into, you know, some kumbaya and everybody gets what they want. It's like, okay, like what's, what culture am I trying to set here? Um, an environment for, for them to flourish. Um, and that's, that answer is different for everybody, right? Yes. Yeah. We're all different, obviously. Yeah. Awesome. David, just, uh, just the last question before we close, what do you think is the, um, the future of the wearable, uh, and fitness space from your perspective? Um, I'm trying to the fitness or wearable space. Um, I think it will become, um, it's very different. I do think the fitness and wearable space will really hit an inflection point. You're already starting to see it, obviously, even today, 2022 versus 2016. It's a very different market. Um, di very, not very, but different user behaviors, it appears. And I think if once you start tying it to outcomes where, okay, you've worked out three days a week, this is where, you know, uh, this is if, if you're, you know, if you have type two diabetes, really understanding, and you're seeing some of the startups around that right now, of what you eat, Verda Health is an awesome company around this. I'm not an investor, it's just what I admire from afar. Um, and I think once this data becomes tied to outcomes, then you're going to start really seeing, um, more mainstream usage and more devices. What's an example? Um, many, many companies do clinical trials, right? And the clinical trials on patients, you want the data around not just um, their 
their genome, their, their vitals for today, it is, I believe, I don't want to butcher the term, phenotypical phenotype data of data, longitudinal data around what they do, right? It is, you know, yes, I'm 52 years old, Asian American, I live in Los Angeles, and there's a certain profile with that. But what do I, what have I actually done in the last three years with respect to what I eat, how much I exercise, um, where I travel, how much of that data is now available for others to use, i.e. you can structure that data, making it available to even some of these companies that are running clinical trials. The more data that they have, the more effective these clinical trials can become. So. Um, I'm sort of rambling right now, but the idea is once you see more outcomes that are tied to this types of data, and I think that will be a function of this data becoming more structured and usable for different, for different groups, then I think you're going to see more and more people incentivized to actually wear the wearables. And it's awesome that to tie it all up, that's part of the reason why we wanted to invest in you is the ability not just to get the data, but to make the data usable for others is something that you could argue. I mean, it's it's the formula for a lot of great businesses out there today. So, um, so we're just happy to be a part of your journey. Fantastic. David, what a fascinating discussion with you as always. Uh, we, we, uh, we learned a lot from you and uh, we have a lot to learn from you. So we keep it for the next discussions. Hopefully next ones are going to be longer. We try to get as much time as possible to learn as much as we can from you. Thank you so much. I mean, it's, we learned so much from you, um, our whole team, and it's been a joy and it's, uh, it, you know, come to, come to the office more and we'll hang out and uh, hopefully we can see you in real life.